Hello. Hello out there. My name is Philip Pastoral. I'm the founder of the Berean Project and the End Times Watch uh, Bible Prophecy Trends and News. And today I'm with a new friend. His name is Timothy. Right. So Timothy, I came here at this undisclosed location. He's the, he's the guy behind the Solomon series, the God Culture channel in YouTube. So some of you have, have been watching this for years and have been wanting to meet you, Timothy. Finally, we get to meet you because in May of this year, 2019, there's going to be a series of conferences, I think, yes. in Luzon. Just to begin. And Visayas and Mindanao. The Solomon's Gold series is uh, very interesting because he's been doing some research and it's about, a lot of you have known, it's about the Philippines where he's actually proven through scripture and through some research that the Philippines actually falls into biblical history, not just history, but also, I think, prophecy. Yes, definitely. So maybe you can share something about how did you get started, Tim? How did you get started in the in, in the Solomon's Gold series, and you know what did you learn along the way? What were the surprises? Anything you want to share? Well, you know the amazing thing was is uh, my wife is uh, Filipina, and we travel to the Philippines rather often. And in being here, uh, I was looking into different channels on YouTube, I believe is where I saw this first. There was a, a video, Philippines is Ophir. And I thought, wow, I know what Ophir is. And, but I've never seen anybody prove the location of Ophir. So I look at it and of course it's like most videos. It's a good video, it's a great claim, but you leave the video thinking, maybe. And we're at a point, because we're a research group, it's not just me, and uh, we're at a point in our lives where we want to prove things. We want to see things proven out completely. And that's what we set out to do. Uh, we tested it first with a fear. Can we find a fear? Does the Bible identify a fear? We looked at the Hebrew words, and we looked into the history, the archaeology, the geography, uh, the science, the, the language, all of those things, to see if we could literally prove it out. And the answer is yes. It, it's actually, the, the history in the Philippines is so abundant. Um, there are things that we've struck along the way that we just never expected. We had no idea. I mean, the things I learned in school, I didn't know any of these things. I knew that there was a, a you know, a first lady there who had a lot of shoes and a little bit about Marcos. But otherwise, we didn't learn much about the Philippines and the U.S. But when it comes down to it, the history is so overwhelming and abundant. And then you add the scripture, and you add the science, and you add the language, and it's amazing. And so I can't really even begin to go into all of the detail that the series does. It's about 30 videos. And we prove this out like a lawyer would. You know, just like when the lawyer prepares to go to court. And that was our goal in all of this, because we're tired of just watching things that make claims. We're not making claims. We literally, actually, really firmly can say 100% that Philippines is in fact Ophir. Not and part of the Bible. From the Bible. But without, That's our foundation. But the name Philippines was not used. It's Ophir. No, no right. And Havila. Right. As we all know, Philippines is a new name. So, you know, what it was called before, there are names floating out there like Maharlika. We, we deal with that. We have a video on that. Uh, and that's actually a valid name as well. But in, in ancient times, in 1000 BC, it was called Ophir. It was called Tarshish. And guess what? The king of Spain knew that. Because he put it in a contract for Sebastian Cabot. And he wrote down where Ophir was. Can you share with us what is the biblical significance of Ophir? Many of, of our viewers probably don't even read the Bible. Why is Ophir important? And what is it, what is it known for? Well, it's known for gold and resources that Solomon used to build the temple. Um, and, and that alone is a great story, but not enough really to even warrant our attention. To be honest, we're looking for the restoration of biblical geography that leads somewhere, that leads to the fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy is important, especially in this day and age. And we literally can restore the Bible geography to a point where we can know where some of these places are where Jesus is talking about in Matthew 12, 42, the queen of the south shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Well, that's the queen of Sheba. Well, where's Sheba? Well, we prove that Sheba can be found, and it's not in Ethiopia. 
It indisputably does not meet the OB. There's two Shivas in the Table of Nations. It is the Shiva brother of the fear in the Philippines. The sons of Yoktan, not yes. of Kosh. That's right. Kosh is the, uh, right. I think, the traditional view. That's right. So, From him. So Christ is talking about a prophecy about the end times where people from the south. And you are saying that this has something to do with Ophir and Sheba, Philippines. Absolutely. 100%. So you have to watch these videos. We're going to post the links down there so you can watch this for those who have not seen it yet. At the same time, in May, we're going to have a conference. Um, a few more questions about along the way when you did your research, uh, how many years have you been working on this project already? Oh my. Um, specifically, this project about three to four years. Three to four years. What kind of surprises did you encounter? What I'm sure along the way you didn't have all the answers at the very beginning. No. And along the way you you discovered things. What were the you, you know? What was the journey like? The funny thing was is our journey initially was just to find no fear. We actually didn't intend to find that Shiva was in Ophir and at the same place. Tarshish is the same place. But then, this really, really big one, and a lot of Filipinos were, we get a lot of comments on the channel if you haven't seen it. And um, many were saying, oh, well, you know what else? Philippines isn't just Ophir, it's the Garden of Eden. And we would respond, oh, that's nice, that's so nice. But the reality was, is we didn't believe that. We didn't think that we'd be able to prove that. And we went off to another series. We have a flood series. So we started our flood series and we started looking into this book called The Book of Jubilees. Well, The Book of Jubilees has directions left by Noah that actually go around the entire earth. Well, here's the funny thing. When you map them out, and we did literally map them out turn by turn around the earth, they lead to the Garden of Eden, which is in one place and only one place on earth, and that's the Philippines. We're like, what? This is impossible. So then we start to test it, we vet it, and again, like we do, we prove it out from every angle we possibly can. So we proved that the Garden of Eden literally is located in the Philippines. But what would you say to those people who would, would, would point out that, you know, the Book of Enoch or Jub Jubilees are not considered part of the canon of Scripture, sure. so six, 66 books, how would you uh, defend that? You know, when it comes down to it, for the purposes of these videos, we use the Book of Jubilees especially as history. It's a history book. It's dated to at least 200 BC. So if nothing else, it's a history book from 200 BC that just so happens to have these directions that lead around the entire Earth and vet fully when you map them out. And the directions to the Garden of Eden can be tested. See, again, we look at this from other angles. If you test the science, it's actually very easy. Where's the origin of, of life? The origin of life can be found by charting marine life, the life that was not destroyed by the flood. Because land animals and man rebooted, but marine life did not. So if you find the most diverse marine population on Earth, you've actually found the land of creation in the Garden of Eden. And that just so happens to be a little pocket in the Sulu, Sulu Sea, it's called the Sulu Suluisi Seascape. It's called the center of the center of marine biodiversity, according to marine biologists today. And that is amazing. And that literally proves, factually, scientifically, that that's the location of ground zero for creation. So he speaks more about that in the videos. Yes, and I much think, more. I think the point here is that Jubilees and these uh, Enoch, these books, they may not be considered maybe uh, inspired, but they can at least be seen as good references that, that may support biblical information. Definitely. So the Philippines, uh, in everything that we've been finding, is there's a massive amount of history out there that's not taught in schools. It certainly wasn't taught to us in the U.S. And uh, from what we're hearing, it hasn't been taught in the Philippines yet. It's right there. You know, Pig of Feta, the Italian scholar, that traveled with Magellan, he wrote a lot. And one of the huge things he wrote actually tells us a lot. The first god he encountered when he came to the Philippines was a god named Abba. Abba's the Aramaic name. For daddy. My father. My father, right. My father. It's the name that Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane for God. So literally, that name got here somehow. And it did not get here through the Muslims because they do not call Allah Father. It's not appropriate. So when it comes down to it, there are so many things like that that he wrote about. He wrote about the ships 
that he encountered when he came here. He wrote about an 80-foot long ship called the Belunga. Guess what? Historians, for years, for centuries, have said, oh, that's not that. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he was only a sailing historian. Uh, yeah, he didn't know what he was talking about. But here's the big thing. They have now unearthed in Butuan, I think, I believe somewhere six, maybe seven, of these 80-foot long balunga. They are real. They literally exist. What, were, what do you think is the estimated range of these ships in terms of sea travel? Why was it? Why would be a significant find in terms of... Uh, well, that wasn't even the largest. Okay. You know, the, the, the Spanish road, or Pigafetta road, uh, when they were attacked, they were attacked by ships just as large as the Spanish ships. And he describes the Philippines, he calls them junks. And again, some historians say, oh, well, they, they couldn't have had junks. Well, China didn't have junks yet, right. which probably says junks came from where? Well, probably the Philippines. In other words, uh, based on the his history that we're, the conventional history that we're learning from, from school and from conventional media, it seems that the, the Philippines may have a history that's far different from what we are maybe understand. Absolutely. The, the technology of their, uh, their ships would be far more advanced than the fact that he's discovered uh, historians say claiming so. I'm just wondering why this didn't come up. Why is it uh, the impression is that prior to the 1500s, we have a nation that's more or less portrayed as cave dwellers yeah. with you know, yeah. very low technology. How did that happen? Well, right? you know, I think a perfect example is the name Abba. Because they, uh, the Jesuits released a Philippine deities list. If you go to Wikipedia, you can find it. Look up Philippine deities list. And you'll find that the name of the first god that was encountered when the Spanish came here, Abba, Abba. isn't on the list. That's fraud. It, it, how can you not include the very first name of the very first god recorded by Pigafetta? And that tells you much. The reality is, is that the history has been suppressed, and for a reason, because someone doesn't want Filipinos to know wow. who they are. They are not third world citizens. They are absolutely 100% in Bible prophecy, and when you restore that, you start to see this place has a purpose. This place has a massive end times purpose, and it's spelled right out in the words of Jesus himself in the words of Isaiah himself. It's right there in scripture, and it can be restored. So Tim, you've uh, started making the videos just over two years ago, I suppose? Yes. So why the anonymity? Why do they know you as the God culture? <laughs> so finally you get well, to see his face, you get to know... But, but that's the whole point of our ministry, is, is it's not about my ugly face. You can tell, tell us about yourself. <laughs> if it's about this, we're in trouble, right? No, but seriously, when it comes down to it, the Bible says that you test a ministry by its fruits. And we almost force people to do that. Because if you go to our channel and you re just read the comments from a lot of Filipinos, in fact, uh, more than half of our traffic is from the Philippines. And uh, so Filipinos are commenting on every video. And when you see many, even Catholics, who have made a deep commitment, not just to experience salvation, but a deep commitment to search him out in his ways at a deeper point. See, that's what we're about. We're the God culture. We want to go back to the days of Adam, and we want to see that restored. We want to understand what the Word says all the way back to that point. Because there's things there that we've lost. You know, Cain, the evil, was the first builder of cities. He's the first one who formed religion. You know, so we're more about getting back to the God culture and getting away from the culture of the gods. In other words, restore uh, that relationship with God we yes. had at the very beginning when yes. Adam and Eve left the garden. So obviously, they knew God. Yeah. And they taught God to their children. But somewhere along the way, something happened. Yeah. And I think what we're seeing is a replay of that that the erasure of history being played out all throughout. Many times over. Another topic that uh, Tim has made about his videos is the topic of the Ten Gospels. So this is quite controversial because uh, myself being a prophecy student for many years, there is a understanding, at least a general understanding, that there are no lost lives. For those who don't have that background, uh, sometime around 1000 BC or 900 uh, 
about 1100 BC when David's kingdom was founded and that led to Solomon his son forming the first monarchy that was in, called the United uh, the uh, Kingdom of Israel. There was a civil war and that kingdom was divided into two. The northern kingdom, which is also known as Ephraim, yep. and the southern kingdom, which is the Davidic line, it's also known as Judah. And uh, history tells us that in 722 BC, the Assyrians came, they conquered uh, the northern tribes of Israel. And uh, well, we don't know what happened to them. And uh, there are two views about that. But the southern kingdom survived. They went to exile in 586 BC when Babylon conquered them. Right. And they came back again to the land. Now, many scholars believe that sometime around the time of Hezekiah, the faithful of the northern tribe actually migrated down to the south. So therefore, there are no ten lost tribes. But there are some people who believe, yeah, there are ten lost tribes. They just vanished into history. Can you tell us more about your uh, your videos on these ten lost tribes and why is it might be hard for people to accept and why maybe sure. are hard? Why do we have an open mind about this topic? Anytime you reach a topic that uh, goes into things that have been understood by tradition, there's always going to be pushback in some form, and it's fun. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. But that's why the Bible tells us to prove all things in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And that's what we try to do. We are a group of researchers, and we prove things out. So what we found in Scripture is Scripture actually identifies where the lost tribes went. It actually identifies that uh, the northern tribes, the ten lost tribes, many are following, uh, were taken into Assyria. But see, the Bible says all were taken, and then it says none returned of the ten tribes of the north. So they went into Assyria. Now, there's another book called the book of Second Esdras. Okay, and Esdras was in the 1611 King James Bible. Uh, it's actually, first and second Esdras is actually Ezra. It's part of the Apocrypha. So it's be... considered part of the Apocrypha. It's actually Ezra 3 and 4. Okay, that's what they're considered. So, but anyway. Second Esther is actually pinpoints, and it says that part of the lost tribes stayed in Assyria. This is just the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom still where they were, not even taken into Babylon yet. That's a separate story. Really. And so they were taken... Just for reference, can you tell us what, have been, what would have been the Assyrian uh, Empire? What would have been encompassed? Very good question. In reality, Syria uh, or Assyria today uh, would be basically um, Iraq, Iraq. Uh, a piece of Iran, which was called Media at the time, uh, and a, a chunk of Turkey and Syria, which form what is called today modern Kurdistan. Okay. So basically you have Iraq and Kurdistan, which are in the news today somehow. But so that's where they went, but that's not where they all stayed. Some stayed there, according to Second Estrus, and then others took a journey for a year and a half, and we chart that journey out completely, and it leads to the same land that the Israelites were going to before, the land of Ophir. So we have an intersection of two I, studies. And that wasn't Ophir. planned, right. but we have hit so many things like that along the way, especially in prophecy, where we're just like, wow, how can that be? But then we vet it from many different angles, and it vets, it, it fits. So, so we're gonna post the link down there on the 10 Lost Tribes, you wanna wanna check that out. And the two stories, the two uh, studies and research on the land of Ophir and how it integrates with the 10 Lost Tribes. I think this, these revelations, if you don't agree with them, at least keep an open mind. You don't have to. Study them and test all things, as Kim would say. Really, the journey itself is worth everything. Because for all of us to take this journey and prove this out for ourselves and really know it. Because that which you have not proved in your life, you don't know. And it's time that we know things. Especially in the days that Daniel predicted, which are either here or coming very soon, of increasing knowledge. So it's not just about biblical history. It's also about the importance of Tell us the importance of prophecy. Why should us serious believers, why should we uh, listen to prophecy? Why is it important we study prophecy? I, I think in many churches today we don't see this. They skip the, uh, the prophetic passages. Why do you think it's important? Well, it's, it's critical. You know, it, it, every time, uh, you know, 
many times in the Bible you see scriptures like know your enemy. You know, we are to know what's going on. In fact, Jesus even says that we will see the signs and we will recognize the signs. We may not know the day or the hour, but we will know Red the sky. season. Right. right. Well, how will we know the season? It's kind of like the, the wise men who saw the star of Bethlehem in the sky. Well, they were looking for that. And I think also Jesus warned us, take heed that no man deceive you. We are commanded Absolutely. to be uh, weary of deceptions because there's a lot of deceptions on the right And unless we understand history and the prophecies, we are going to uh, be prone to deception. And deception linked to a second coming. And we know that there's going to be uh, a false messiah. Absolutely. That maybe Absolutely. you can tell us something more about why, you know, many people may not believe this, but that's what the, the prophets say. There is going to be a false messiah. Absolutely. 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 I mean, if you study the beast in Revelation and his characteristics, you're going to find a real man, okay, who has superpowers, or at least can purport that he does, whether they're real or not, doesn't matter if it's magic, whatever. But whatever it is, people are going to believe that this man is a bit of a demigod. Okay, that takes us all the way back to the days before the flood. You know, we're seeing a return of what has already happened. Uh, you study Greek mythology, you actually have seen the beast already because you see that there. So, so we see a lot of uh, what they call as mythology return out of Genesis 6. Pretty much ties in with all that myth, right? Absolutely, 100%. And I think, I think the bottom line is that we are now in the end times. We're in the, the time where prophecies are now coming to pass. And this is more relevant, more than ever, for us to watch the sign of his coming. So yes. we need to prepare the church, prepare ourselves to be faithful. So then, uh, before we uh, close this this, uh, this presentation, maybe you can tell us about the, uh, the conference, conferences which are taking place sure. in May of 2019. What's going to happen and what can people expect? Well, right now we have, I believe, seven dates confirmed um, in uh, between Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, so it's kind of all, right, all over the Philippines, even one all the way up in Aurora, so right. I'm excited about that. Can't wait to go to Aurora. But basically what we're going to do is, uh, certainly we'll have some worship and, and a great time of fellowship, but we're going to dig deep into scripture, and we're going to show you what the Bible says about these places and why they matter. And they matter. They matter immensely in the last days. And then we're going to challenge you to do exactly what Jesus said, to rise up in judgment with this generation and take your place because the Philippines has a place in prophecy. I think it's not just for Philippines, but not for, just for anyone who is serious about prophecy, about the Bible, and, and listening to Jesus' commands. Tim, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for meeting us and having the pleasure of introducing you to so many people who've been wanting to meet the people. He's the person, the lead person behind the God Culture. Just one. But we can't wait to meet you. So thank you and watch the video so that when you come to the conferences, at least you have a background. And we can ask questions and we can learn more uh, by the time we have the conferences. So we will look forward to seeing you on May. Absolutely. God bless. God bless. Thank you.